Doomfist Gauntlet. From the very moment we announced Overwatch, Doomfist was part of the story. Oh man, they said he could level a skyscraper. It immediately raised questions in everybody's mind. Who is this Doomfist guy? Doomfist, the man, the myth, the legend. Built from nothing but the name alone, and designed as a love letter to the genre of classic arcade fighting games. This hero has had many ups and downs over his time in the game, with almost every problem that's impacted his state of being and feeling in the game tracing back to his design core. Today, I will inspect his design core with the aim to offer up potential solutions the dev team could take in order to properly handle Doomfist so that his place in the game is more clearly defined and as many people are as satisfied as possible. Before we begin, this video won't be covering Doomfist bugs and ability issues, we just don't have the time to do that. The main focus will be on Doomfist gameplay experience and how the shortcomings in his design affect the experience of playing as and against him. My name is Cream, and if you already know that name, you would likely know me as one of the managers of Doomfist active bug list alongside Get Quaked On, a person I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with. I've been around since Overwatch first launched in 2016 and have logged near 500 hours on Doomfist with a near 1500 total hours in the game. I own the Doomfist Mains Discord server, and I'm directly responsible for virtually everything written on the Doomfist fandom wiki page. Over the years, I've logged countless bugs with Get Quaked On, helped him develop a couple of texts, provided meaningful feedback to the developers, and I'm even directly responsible for a couple of changes made in the previous game. So strap in, and enjoy the ride as we explore the state of Doomfist, the most frustrating yet enthralling hero in Overwatch, too difficult for Team 4 to handle. Oh god! Oh, oh. It's no secret that over Doomfist's time in Overwatch, he's been a regular source of issues. And I don't just mean issues like being a broken, overpowered meta pick that overtakes the game experience, or his outlandish potential for bugs. When I say issues in this regard, I'm talking about the fact that historically, Doomfist has been one of, if not the most widely and consistently despised hero by the vast majority of the player base. But why? The answer to this is a combination of three elements. Raw burst damage potential, crowd control, and hypermobility. Raw burst damage potential is high amounts of damage dealt in a short amount of time, something widely understood through the idea of the one shot. Nobody likes dying to something instantly. It takes away a player's agency to fight back, and ultimately it feels cheap. This is why snipers are so widely despised in most video games, because even though it takes mechanical skill to land a shot, in most cases, it still feels cheap. Crowd control, or CC, is that funny effect we as a community love to hate with all our heart and soul. CC in Overwatch 2 covers any form of negative status effect that alters the player's interaction with the game. And people's definitions of this vary to include or exclude certain effects, but at its strictest definition, there is a lot of this shit in the game. 99% of which feels like total ass to combat. With the exception of knockback and damage over time, CC is mostly restricted to the tank role, with only a handful of exceptions in other roles as a part of their hero fantasy. Because the more of this that exists across the game, the less agency the player base has over what they want to try and accomplish. Hypermobility is, well, you are hyper, and you are mobile. You go fast, and you go far. While this is not an inherently bad thing to have in a game, up to a certain point it gets pretty frustrating trying to fight something moving so fast and unpredictably that you struggle to even hit the damn thing. Now, let's rewind time and inspect Doomfist as he used to be. Doomfist launched in 2017 as a DPS character with 250 health and 3 abilities. Rocket Punch, Seismic Slam, and fan favourite Rising Uppercut, along with his ultimate Meteor Strike. All of these abilities presented obscene CC capabilities, burst damage, and hypermobility in a combination that was just not fun or healthy to play against, even though it was a rush of pure dopamine for the Doomfist player. Rocket Punch could one-shot a 250 health target on a full charge plus wall impact, making this sound an instant alert to all squishies that death was imminent. Rising Uppercut was one of two abilities in the game that forced enemies up into the air, which combined with the total movement lock it imposed made it the most frustrating thing to fight about Doom beyond his one-shot. Seismic Slam possessed a partial movement lock that was somewhat counterable with movement, 
It also had two different variations, adding numerous layers of complexity and skill expression, but also adding equally as many technical problems as well. Meteor Strike was generally a guaranteed pick on the target tool of choice unless they had flawless positioning or a Zarya to bubble them. Add on the bonkers amount of tech that was discovered, developed and refined, and all of a sudden Doomfist possesses the single highest skill ceiling in the entire game, with theoretically infinite potential for gameplay expression. All of these factors combined meant that a Doomfist in theory was exceptionally independent, seemingly ever present, and was able to do pretty much whatever they wanted if they understood how to execute it. While he was not that generally great in practice for a couple of reasons, he still had the capacity to exert complete control over anyone he chose to target. Fast forward to Overwatch 2, and to solve these problems, Doomfist was reworked. The game's core shifted from 6v6 to 5v5, had a healthier, less CC-oriented outlook on its gameplay, and Doomfist became Tankfist to match this theme. Doomfist was way less frustrating to fight, and was no longer a universally hated hypercancer, because his interactions with the game overall were much healthier for two main reasons. His raw burst damage potential was dramatically reduced, and his CC capacity was massively cut. While the Doomfist community was sad to see their old iteration go away, the rework was mostly a success. We just didn't know it at the time. The shift from DPS Doomfist to Tank Doomfist was difficult, and adjusting to the new ability set, how they flowed, and what they were intended to accomplish was not something people were able to do very quickly. Because of this, the initial reception of his rework kit and play was incredibly underwhelming, with people citing many different reasons why they felt like they were doing nothing or had no impact. They say hindsight is 2020, and when looking back at Doomfist's state of balance in Season 1, I can see why that saying has been around for as long as it has, since we now understand how to actually play Tank Doomfist properly and can identify the main problems he dealt with back in Season 1 with crystal clarity. Rocket Punch did abysmal damage, being generally weaker than a standard melee hit, coupled with the fact that it didn't stun enemies on a wall impact, which made follow-up shots difficult to land consistently, taking away some of the impact it was supposed to provide, even on its new shiny 3 second cooldown. Hand Cannon's effectiveness was also tuned down in the rework, becoming slightly weaker per shot, which made it feel much weaker than it seemed due to a combination of other factors at the time. Seismic Slam was very meh, purely for the fact that it had a very strong slow effect in the beta that was stripped on launch and replaced with a movement micro lock, which was incredibly mundane and very specialised, but it works when it needs to. It was a solid ability, but at the time it was also plagued by the worst set of issues it's ever seen which forced it to no reg regularly, drastically diminishing its capacity for any impact at all. Meteor Strike got hung, drawn, and fucking quartered in the transition, and anyone who thinks or insists otherwise for whatever reason is just plain wrong. While it was no longer intended for getting picks or killing, the new problem it developed, besides its new lack of identity, is that it became so unthreatening that people regularly walked into the landing zone like it didn't matter. It's just a bad old, plain and simple. The passive was unchanged, but wasn't too bad. It did its job and kept Doom from just exploding at all times. Finally, we have the elephant in the room. Power Block. Power Block was... different. There was nothing else like it in the game just yet, and it felt unintuitive and confusing to throw into Doomfist's kit as it fundamentally changed the flow of his play, but it was balanced pretty well. Slowing Doomfist down considerably when used and massively reducing all incoming damage from in front of him if used correctly, could further enhance his offensive capability. Enter the Empowered Rocket Punch. A new, shiny version of Rocket Punch that can only be obtained through the use of Power Block. It does more damage, has a bigger multi-target area of effect, lets Doomfist travel further and faster across the battlefield, and can stun. It was an insanely powerful ability, and was the connection the Doomfist community needed between old and new Doomfist. Hello, greetings. Gaining an empowered rocket punch through mitigating enough damage is a solid idea on paper. Unfortunately, it suffers from what I call the defense matrix effect, where if you simply don't shoot it, its value drops to approximately nothing. And unlike defense matrix or Sigma's kinetic grasp, this ability can't be angled or redirected to catch damage targeted at other players. It was a difficult ability to get used to, especially given it didn't block CC. So deciding on when to use it made it that much more confusing for the newly acquainted player base. This was his opening state, and we were almost universally unhappy with it. Mostly because very, very few of us understood what we had, but also because it was lacking in raw power output, and even though he retained his independence and freedom, he had virtually no capacity for direct impact unless the player understood what he had become. 
This state is also where my balance theory and approaches for Doomfist stem from. My theory is that Doomfist can only be at 66% to be well balanced, so to speak. Only two of the three elements we mentioned earlier can be realistically utilized, or a combination of all three up to 66 out of 100%. Presence as a disruptive style brawler tank. That's what the devs wanted to do with Doomfist in Season 2, when they gave him 10 buffs and 2 halfnerves to try and satisfy the player's dissatisfaction at his launch state. Only, they didn't brush up on their history when they did this and added more CC back into his kit while upping his damage at the same time, turning him back into a hyper cancer. Doomfist can only have an abundance of two of the three elements that previously caused him to be like this, and with the additional CC and damage increase of Season 2, he now was overloaded with all of them. While he was almost immediately nerfed, this overabundance of elements remained and created a frustration problem that built up over time and reached its peak when he was considered by most to be in a really good all-round state of balance, just a little bit before the Le Seraphim collaboration patch. In this state, Doomfist felt really, really good to play, even though he was pretty hard to play effectively, and every element was so evenly distributed across his kit that each little piece played an integral role to his feeling of balance. This meant that no matter what was changed, the perception of Doomfist's strength would start to fall apart if anything were to get nerfed, but the frustration problem meant that one of these elements needed to be nerfed. So, Doomfist received a seemingly small change to punch stun durations, aimed at reducing that frustration, and it succeeded in that regard, but it also caused Doomfist's feeling of power to crumble on the spot, as that particular element held the most control over his feeling of power and independence. Around the same time this frustration was peaking, players were also suffering from general gameplay fatigue and vocalising their frustrations with how generally powerful the supports were for how little effort they required. Tanks especially felt this fatigue more than other classes as almost all the tanks were subject to every shitty feeling possible in the game. All except one. Doomfist was the most independent tank in the roster with enough impact and threat to matter, which put him in a unique position to give tank players their fun factor back and most importantly their agency as well something that was desperately sought after in an era where tank agency was at its lowest. So naturally, his pick rate shot up a bit, exposing the frustrations of his kit even more. Raw pick rates and win rates don't dictate a hero's state of balance though. They're often cited as indicators of a hero's state of balance and while that's partly accurate, it's only a small fraction of the picture. My perspective on Doomfist takes pick rates and win rates out of the equation. These are not relevant for this analysis. I am inspecting him with a deep knowledge of his strengths, weaknesses, what he can and can't do when played at his uppermost limits, and most importantly, what is practical for the average player to achieve with him. The strengths and weaknesses of a hero's core elements also fit into their overall effort for value ratio. Every hero has one of these, and the tanks in general have some of the most lopsided ones. It's a concept I don't really see active discussion on, but the short version is, it's an abstract ratio that indicates the amount of effort a player is required to put in to gain value for their team. This idea has been discussed in length by Spilo, where he separates effort or skill and value into separate charts for a clearer and deeper explanation. A link to a relevant video will be in the description, but just go check out Spilo in general anyway. He straight up provides the best free coaching material you can find bar none, and he's also just a good content creator. At this point of Doom's balance, all three of the elements we mentioned earlier contributed very evenly to his effort for value ratio, which was already its own problem because it was arguably the most lopsided in the entire game, second only to Wrecking Ball. So the weakening of one element, the stuns, caused this ratio to become even more lopsided, making Doomfist feel massively weaker than he actually was. Something else to note, the objective being and feeling of something in its game are two very important differences to distinguish. Something can be powerful, but feel very mediocre, and vice versa. For example, passive actions like Mercy's healing and damage memes feel kinda meh and unimpactful because they're just there. There's little to no feeling of impact, but in reality they're powerful tools that can sustain allies or enable them to delete enemies much faster. On the flip side, very active actions like Orissa feel pretty impactful and prominent on the battlefield when she presses all her buttons and lives forever but outside of a yeet stick and having good aim, she has pretty minimal impact on fights since all of her abilities are designed primarily for her survival, not for direct gameplay impact. Doomfist holds a solid level of power and has probably the most active feeling gameplay of all the heroes in the roster. There's so much potential in him, 
but that potential feels squashed because when paired with the extreme effort required to use it well, his power feels almost entirely meaningless. There are a lot of things that could help Doomfist feel much better in this regard, but he also needs to meet the developer's desire for frustration alleviation, so isolating and tuning the elements of his kit most detrimental to his gameplay, alongside those that contribute to the frustration of fighting him, are the keys to correctly adjusting him. In order to do that right, we also need to touch on balance and design philosophy a little bit. It's very difficult to balance something if the core philosophy of its design is not properly established, and the core philosophy for what the developers want out of each hero is the guiding light for the balance team. It's also been represented as the concept of the hero fantasy. We've seen expressions of ideal direction a couple of times across Overwatch 2's life cycle, with some notable exceptions being Ball, Queen, Sombra, May, a not explicitly written combined goal for Symmetra and Torbjorn, alongside an expression for Doomfist during Season 2. Wait, hang on a minute. Why are we here if they've expressed what they want to do with Doomfist? Well, they may have expressed that, and technically followed it, but what they've failed to realise is that it's come at the cost of an already established hero fantasy. The love letter to the arcade fighting game genre. This original fantasy feels like a distant memory. You could argue that the new identity was outlined in Season 2 with the expression of presence as a disruptive style brawler tank, but we're on the cusp of Season 9 and it doesn't really feel like this has been achieved correctly. It feels like the developers have lost sight of Doomfist Hero Fantasy somewhere along the path to balancing his pick and win rates. Hell, I can't even accurately identify what's driving him. I fucking main him. I've sunk 500 hours into him. He doesn't seem to have a Hero Fantasy anymore. Not unless you count his outlandish potential for bugs. They do pretty fucking well in that regard. The only identity I can really attribute to Doomfist right now is that of a skill check. I also personally think that the development team just don't quite understand what makes this hero function, how he plays, and most importantly, why people gathered to play him in the first place. The most recent changes were the metaphorical nail in the coffin for me to be confident about this sentiment. But that doesn't mean they aren't learning. The change signifies they're looking in the right directions to change him, but they're doing them for all the wrong reasons. So to help this, I'm going to highlight some small problems in his kit, analyse them, and present ideas that aim to make Doomfist's effort for value ratio not so lopsided you need hundreds of hours to overcome them effectively. To properly communicate why I want to talk about these things I'll highlight, I need to outline some key points that will help sum up the overarching problem Doomfist deals with so that we're all on the same page. We have six key points. Doomfist's capacity for effective play and self-follow-up require overwhelming calculation and precision, majority of the time to be even mildly effective. There is virtually no room for error when playing him. Attaining empowerment feels like it takes too much effort to earn what is now a mediocre power-up. Doomfist's ultimate ability specifically feels outrageously unimpactful, even when used correctly. There are arbitrary limitations on each ability that contribute to the crappy feelings Doomfist is regularly subject to. A core element of Doomfist's identity, complete freedom of gameplay expression through increasingly complex text, has been taken away. And last, but certainly not least, technical issues, aka bugs. The bugs are being worked on thanks to Get Quaked On and myself, and because of the nature of these issues, they are their own independent problem. They are not factors to Doomfist's state of balance, but that's just not how you do that. They do contribute to his feeling of balance though, because they introduce arbitrary limitations and change the way things work on almost every patch, which is pretty important to know about. I also feel that the work on them is too slow. It's the one thing both Doom and non-Doom players always suggest when threads about helping him appear, and there are just so many of them that it feels weird that they aren't given more attention. We don't expect instantaneous fixes, but we haven't seen enough constant work put into fixing them, and we're starting to feel like the ever-growing list is just a pointless effort. All six of our key points can be summed up with one sentence. Getting any meaningful value with Doomfist is far more difficult than it is worth compared to all of the other tanks in the game, even for players who specialise in Doomfist. I and a slew of Doomfist specialists all agree with this sentiment, and I believe that there are ways to solve it without completely breaking him. With all the points outlined, it's important to note that these changes are aimed at working within the bounds of what Doomfist currently is. He's not going to get reworked again, we have to live with what we've got now, so I want to improve that without radically changing anything again. They're not to be viewed as a full set of changes either, they're individual, 
each with their own goals and points to alleviate, which I believe would be in the best interest of the game. For Doomfist to be truly better in every single way possible, his entire kit needs to be almost completely redesigned again, and I don't have the spare sanity to commit to that kind of project. There is also an argument that more holistic, global-oriented changes to damage and healing numbers would be healthier to implement and invalidate some of the issues I set out here to fix, but that's a whole other thing. Hi, Future Me here. We're now at the point where Season 10 is only one week away, and it would be worth touching on what was affected by the changes of Season 9. Points 1 and 2 were the only ones affected positively at the start of Season 9. The projectile size changes made it easier to land meaningful hand cannon damage, but this was half undone with the mid-season change. Empowered Punch feels super hefty again, because Punch's base damage has got adjusted, so I'd say point 2 has been fully resolved. As for the rest, points 3, 5 and 6 were actually affected negatively. Meteor feels even more useless somehow, and this was only marginally improved with the mid-season patch. It was a correct change for Meteor, but it was applied a little too heavily, I think. We lost the ability to perform another tech at the start of the season, and while the overall bug count dropped, some existing issues got considerably worse. Aside from a couple things, pretty much everything I'm about to cover remains a relevant point in this season, even though Doom is now one of, if not the strongest tank to play. I feel the need to stress that being strong or overly viable doesn't negate the existence of flaws and oversights in the hero's kits or designs though. The hero's state of being is far more complex than their viability in Meadows, it's just not that black and white. With that said, let's get back to it. We're going to inspect each ability individually and address its strengths, weaknesses and intended uses before identifying a flaw tied to a pain point and applying a change that would aid Doomfizz in being a little more forgiving without compromising a state of power. We'll also make a note of anything that would be too broadly risky to change, even if it aligns with helping Doomfist. Once we've covered all the serious things, I also want to touch upon some of the more popular changes I see suggested around the community that are too radical of a change for this project or don't quite solve any of his problems. With that said, this is how I would fix Doomfist. We begin with Doomfist's primary fire, Hand Cannon a shotgun built into Doomfist's left hand that fires out his broken knuckle bones. It has a clip of 4 shots, each firing 11 pallets in a fixed spread at 5 damage each for a total of 55 damage, should all the pallets land within its 15 meter fall off range. Beyond 15 meters, the damage falls off to basically nothing, which for a melee oriented character, makes sense. It's comboed regularly with Rocket Punch as Doom's bread and butter combo, and is his primary source for damage output and kill confirmation and there's an aspect of this shotgun-like design that becomes a problem when coupled with Doomfist design and the rest of the game's character model designs. The Spread Yes, it is a shotgun. Yes, conventionally games have designed shotguns to have an insane spread beyond pretty much melee range, but Overwatch is not a conventional game, and Doomfist is the single most unconventional character you could add to an FPS-oriented game, meaning that some rules must be bent or broken for the gameplay experience to work. Doomfist's primary weapon spread is an example of this concept, as the vast majority of the Overwatch cast have relatively slim figures that just cause his shots to miss, even with perfect aim in the ideal range. I went ahead and tested this in the training range just to triple check and make sure I'm not coping over my own bad aim, and it turns out that yeah, I'm fucking right. I'm not completely trash at the game, we're only kinda trash. From the edge of the first damage range, at 15 meters, all the way up to just 10 meters away, the spread of hand cannon will cause large portions of the shot to just miss, even with perfect aim to a character's center of mass. All of the tanks and some other heroes provide exceptions to this since they have just extra large models and hitboxes, but that's beside the point. Upon dissection of how Doomfist plays, we realize that his ideal engagement range sits between 8 to 13 meters, where most heroes are dealing their maximum damage values with high precision. Yet, Doomfist can aim flawlessly and… miss? We need to also keep in mind that these tests did not factor in two very critically important variables, healing and movement. Healing in this game is so comically strong that most things can just outheal a last shot or two Doomfist pumped out like it was nothing. And once you factor in general movement, well you can see for yourself how radically some models change. This doesn't even factor in mobility abilities. Being Doomfist's primary source of damage in Overwatch 2, Hand Cannon also presents a bit of a consistency problem, with only 4 shots. Granted, they're on an automatic reload, and nothing can interrupt that other than firing it again, it still has pretty shitty uptime, especially when you consider the fact that people don't hit 100% of their shots all the time. More specifically, this uptime problem appears after the last shell is fired where it has an increased reload time compared to the rest of the shells. 
This last shot reload timer is where this problem hits the hardest. All of this bundled together unnecessarily increases the difficulty of securing meaningful impact with Doomfist's primary fire, which is now his main source of damage output in Overwatch 2 since Rocket Punch and Seismic Slam's damages were reined back, Uppercut was removed, and he entirely changed role and playstyle. Hand Cannon's impact is now more important than it ever used to be, so why are we punished for just using it? What if we weren't? There are two simple solutions for this that don't change breakpoints and make it easier for Doomfist to just have a little more uptime and reliable impact. We could tighten the spread a little bit, so that the pellets just don't miss beyond 10 meters. We don't like being punished for the weapon's design, that just doesn't feel good. Tightening the spread just a smidge would increase the reliability so long as the player can aim, making hand cannon more reliable at the average engagement distance for Doomfist while also preserving the aim-centric nature of its impact is the perfect way to balance it for all parties involved. My dumbass even went and did the math for this. Here you go. I lost an entire day trying to figure out how numbers work to calculate these correctly, and I know it looks intimidating as shit, but the short version is, just lowering it to a flat 2 degrees would probably do the trick. We could also reinspect the final shot reload timer. Reinspecting this timer could help increase his pressure and uptime without changing any breakpoints and give him a little breathing room to maybe miss a single shot in his engagements. Adjusting Hand Cannon's final shot reload timer from 0.75 seconds to something like 0.5 seconds seems minimal, but would actually allow Doomfizz to pump out a few more Hand Cannon shots more regularly. Just those two things would increase Hand Cannon's impact through reliability and uptime without actually altering the number of shots he needs to do his thing. I am in the mindset that both of these solutions are necessary changes Doomfist needs to get, and for the rest of the video, I will continue to note any other changes I personally feel are required changes to better help Doomfist in a healthy way. Moving on, we have Seismic Slam, the meh ability, that has mostly flown under the radar. For context, Slam was a big focal point in the beta. It had a cooldown of 6 seconds, swapped to 8 on release, and applied a 30% slow for 3 seconds on struck targets, which was completely stripped just before launch for combo reasons tied to Meteor Strike. It deals 50 damage to all targets and returns 35 shields per target in its affected area, a cone spanning 18 meters in front of Doomfist on a 100 degree angle at its point of origin. This ability is pretty solid in all of its aspects and shines brightest through the hypermobility it can provide. Like Rocket Punch, it also doubles as a mobility tool should Doomfist need to cross massive distances really quickly. So what's the problem here? Well, Seismic Slam may still do all of these things and be powerful, but unlike its beta iteration, it doesn't feel powerful when it does them due to the absence of a noticeable effect like the slow, leaving it without that oomph factor. Without some kind of notable effect like that, it also can't be comboed with other aspects of Doomfist's kit for damage output like Hand Cannon as effectively which is something that would open up the potential for different styles of gameplay for players to express themselves through, and allow Doom players to maintain their impact without having to be so hyper-focused on Rocket Punch for the heavy lifting, relegating Slam to a glorified mobility tool. We could return to Doomfist's combo master route with the right changes. Another more obscure issue with this ability that only I have ever actually made a point to talk about, even in the previous game, is the vertical range of Seismic Slam. This is our first arbitrary limitation. For those unaware, Slam has a vertical height the same way Earthshatter does. Slam's height sits at precisely 1.45 meters both up and down from its surface of origin, totaling 2.9 meters, and lining up with Doomfist's eye level. This limitation prevents Slam from reaching players standing in a lot of places it really just looks like Slam should reach, and has personally frustrated me more times than I can care to count. So how can we give Slam that oomph factor without totally breaking the already kinda strong ability? The two changes that can help address these points, pretty simple. We could reinstate the slow effect on Seismic Slam. If this were to happen though, it would need to be applied in a much lesser capacity than its beta iteration, which again for reference was 30% for 3 seconds. The slow on Slam felt amazing to have, it was the oomph factor Slam needed, but it was also way too strong. Turning both its duration and strength back to something like 15% for half a second would allow Doomfist to be more flexible with his abilities and their combos, allowing for greater skill expression with a variety of combos using his entire kit, and returning to his fighting game combo master roots. The glaring problem with the suggestion is that it would likely make playing against Doomfist feel significantly worse. So changes of this nature are always going to be subject to intense scrutiny due to the potential impact on player enjoyment. 
We could also increase the height of Seismic Slam. Increasing its height, even just a little bit, would increase the general consistency of Slam across game geometry and make it more reliable. I feel incredibly strongly about this and believe it's a necessary change so Slam could be more reliable than just navigating across the maps in general. The best part of this change specifically is that it does not directly affect his state of balance in any way shape or form. It only makes the ability more functionally reliable to use. I think this change shouldn't be a matter of if, but a matter of when. Both of these changes help to make Seismic Slam more reliable and give it potential identity beyond a glorified mobility tool. Though I believe that only the height increase really needs to happen. A slow effect could happen. I would love to see Doom return to his combo master identity again, but a slow effect would increase his frustration factor just way too much, no matter the capacity it's applied. Power block has been the single hottest topic among the Doomfist main since Overwatch 2's launch. Being the new kid on the block, not everybody was very eager to welcome it or try it out given it didn't particularly fit Doomfist as a character and replaced fan favourite ability, Rising Uppercut. On activation of Power Block, Doom slows himself and enters a blocking stance, where all damage taken from the front only is mitigated by 80% for up to 2.5 seconds. To top this off, mitigating 100 damage or more with a single use of Power Block provides him with a state known as Empowerment, where his next rocket punch is amplified with various stat boosts. Now this sounds cool and all, but what's the problem? Unfortunately, unlike the rest of his abilities, Power Block does not quite fit the flow of Doomfist Kid, and often interrupts that flow to try and do its thing with wildly varying success rates. During the 2.5 seconds he can hold it active, players can simply choose to not shoot him, rendering the ability pointless. And should Doomfist attempt to jump in the way of oncoming damage targeted at other people, he would find it pretty hard to do so because of the 35% movement penalty, effectively punishing him for trying to be proactive and creative with Power Block. With that arbitrary limitation in mind, the mitigation required to empower the gauntlet also quite high in a lot of players' minds. Mitigating 100 damage doesn't seem like much, until you realise it doesn't mean take 100 damage, it means block 100 damage, which means you have to take 125 damage to block 80% of it, which totals to 100 damage, meaning you have to actively do the math to block the 100 damage to get empowerment, because in reality, you're actually looking to get 125 damage, not 100 damage, and don't even get me started on how Discord and other damage is what you look for, basically, right? Right, so if you're a dumbass like me and got confused by this somewhere along the way, don't worry, that's normal. Just about everyone has been confused by how this works at some point, because the words block and mitigate in this context both imply the same meaning, making the description of power block really misleading to newcomers. Quake went into a deep dive on this mechanic in his tank doom guide, and I even had to make a PSA to the 3000 plus Doomfist players in the Doom mains discord early into Overwatch 2's life cycle just to clarify how this mechanic worked. Much like other aspects of his kit, I've always hated how this ability is not quite clarified properly, and I'm pretty sure others do as well. The point I'm trying to make is that there is no clarity in the way this ability's gimmick is conveyed unless you're knee deep in the source like us Doomfist specialists, you know everything because you're a content creator and this game is your job, or you're a developer. If anything, it's misleading for the casual player base because as mentioned before, block and mitigate in these contexts are often interpreted as meaning the same thing. Now we got a bit derailed there, because I had to vent that point about clarity, and it will become relevant again later on, but for now let's get back on track. There are easy ways to fix up power block, but there are two schools of thought that guide it, only one of which can be followed. It's too hard to get empowered reliably, we need to make it easier to get. And getting empowered is okay, the power up just needs to be more impactful. Personally, I'm a combination of both camps, because I think that getting empowered could feel like a better more reliable process, and that empowerment needs to be a more meaningful power up. I believe Doomfist needs more opportunity to empower himself and for it to be kind of difficult to achieve, but empowerment should also be a scary powerful thing. Doomfist is actively restrained from attempting to be proactive with power block by the 35% movement speed penalty, and is unable to catch damage if enemies choose to shoot other targets around him, cutting his opportunity for empowerment down rather dramatically. I would call this one of our arbitrary limitations. Many also consider the amount of damage required to empower Doomfist Gauntlet to be too high, and in most cases it requires Doomfist to wait for a wave of spam to guarantee empowerment, making it incredibly difficult and often inconsistent to get, unless you can identify someone on the other team that doesn't know any better and will freely feed him empowerment, which starting at gold and going up the ranks quickly becomes about nobody. We can fix both of these problems pretty easily, but we can only take one path to do so, or we risk a repeat of Season 2. 
we could flat out remove or greatly reduce the movement speed penalty to something more like 15% while using power block to allow doofus more opportunity to proactively attain empowerment and simultaneously defend teammates. I personally feel that this change should happen for the heightened flexibility, feeling and fluidity, but the vast majority of the players feel pretty strongly about the second option. We could also lower the damage mitigation threshold back down to 90, also known as 112.5. This is what it was set at in Season 1, when the Doom Men didn't fully understand how everything worked just yet. On reflection, it was a good threshold for attaining empowerment. It wasn't too easy, and it wasn't too difficult either. It was the perfect middle ground, because Season 2 proved that 80 was way too low, and a lot of players share the sentiment that 100, what it's at now, is too high. In Season 2, Doomfist got more opportunity to empower himself, and it was made easier to get. It's one or the other. We can't have both. We need to pick a lane and stick to it. Now before we move on, this is the part where I talk about sticky items. I'll try to keep it brief. I don't like how Doomfist can block damage from sticky items. I think it just removes the skill and counterplay from Doomfist and those that interact with power block in this way, and turns most sticky items into free empowerments the other players simply can't avoid. I think it would be healthier for him not to be able to block sticky items, but for those abilities to deal less general damage. Pulse Bomb excluded, of course. That's my short two cents on that part. Let's move on now. Next, we have Rocket Punch. The core focus of Doomfist's entire kit, and the ability that across the game's transition has gone from raw dopamine rush to a mediocre slap. And honestly, fair enough. Could you imagine how absolutely busted Doomfist would be if he could still one-tap a 250 health hero with one punch? Doomfist charges his gauntlet and launches himself at enemy targets, dealing scaling damage and knockback to whoever he hits along with anyone else near them. Additional damage and a micro stun are applied if they manage to impact a wall and all of these aspects are amplified massively when Doomfist is empowered. All of these elements together seem quite strong, and if not correctly balanced, they absolutely are. Having so many little things to juggle in one ability makes it incredibly difficult to correctly balance, and for the most part, the developers have done pretty well at managing Rocket Punch's power and ensuring that as many people as possible are satisfied with its state. If you ask me though, this ability is not quite perfect. There are a few small things I've identified that contribute to Doomfist's laundry list of problems, and if you couldn't tell already, I'm a big fan of little things making a huge difference. So some small tweaks would make a world of difference in applying the impact Rocket Punch holds. Unlike other abilities, the adjustments for Rocket Punch could realistically be left unchanged, so the ideas will be outlined a little more in depth and then compiled and summarised afterwards. Number 1. Potential Damage Output Compared to other high impact tank abilities, Rocket Punch deals quite a low amount of consistent and reliable damage. Diva's Micro Missiles, Junker Queen's Carnage Axe, Reinhardt's Fire Strike, Sigma's Accretion, Ball's Pile Driver, and Orissa's Javelin Throw all generally do more per activation far more consistently than Rocket Punch can achieve, unless Doomfist can guarantee a max charge plus wall impact. There are two abilities on this list that can be used for a direct comparison to Rocket Punch. Most of you might be able to pick the obvious comparison to Orissa's Javelin Throw since it's the same ability, just a step to the left. Javelin is the easiest to compare to Punch at face value, however I like to compare it to Junker Queen's Carnage Axe, at least in this specific context where damage and brawling is the focus. I actually find Carnage Axe to be a better comparison as both Punch and Axe, when utilised in a brawl, can and do both benefit from hitting multiple targets but only Axe actually outputs consistent damage as it does not require a charge level or a secondary element, like the wall impact, to apply all of its damage. While I like to make this comparison, it is quite flawed, as the general goals of each ability are wildly different. Flatter increasing Punch's impact damage wouldn't work, as it would make it a little too generally impactful. However, if the wall impact damage were scaled up again, Punch could return to its roots and be a properly devastating ability that takes skill to pull its full value out. Punch is already pretty okay with its impact damage, but if the wall impact damage were raised, it could remain consistent in its general output while allowing for that extra oomph should players land the wall impacts consistently. Plus, looking at the numbers I'd scale to, it's nice, intuitive, and neat. It pleases my monkey brain when numbers go boom. Number 2. Empowered Rocket Punch the feeling of Empowered Rocket Punch has been on a slow downward trend since its launch as its entire point was slowly removed patch by patch, that point being the bridge between old and new Rocket Punch. 
the proper, actually scary threat it held at its launch, is now gone, and there are two routes to take to restore this feeling. The more damage route, or the more stun route. And as much as I hate to say it, I think the more stun route is actually the better of the two evils. Hear me out here. If the empowered damage multiplier were to be raised higher than 50%, Punch would once again have that bridge back to its Overwatch 1 roots. However, it moves back into true one-shot territory, which isn't fun for anybody to fight, especially with the AoE mechanic. Having all the damage happen all at once means it can't be out healed and leaves no room for allies to react and intervene to save a target, nor does it leave the target room to fight back in any capacity, like what the devs want. With higher stun times, there is room for players to intervene and help, but it doesn't quite leave room for the target themselves to fight back. I don't have a workaround for this yet, it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. When the stun timers were initially changed in Season 2, the minimum stun time was lowered, which was a good move, but the maximum was also lowered, which hit the ability pretty hard. A very simple solution to help Empowered Punch feel both more consistent and impactful would be to re-raise the stun timers to the previous values of 0.25 to 1 second. Granting Empowerment its scary status again and enabling Doomfist to grant himself enough follow-up time to ensure value. Number 3. Impact Angle This topic is pretty unknown to most and needs some explaining for those who don't play Doomfist. Rocket Punch calculates whether or not a target impacts a wall using GEOMETRY! Think angles and protractors. 5th grade maths. For a target to impact a wall, they must have a trajectory angle less than or equal to 45 degrees to the wall. Any angle greater than 45 degrees will cause a target to slide along the surface. This is not a bug, it's an intended mechanic. It's only a bug if they slide within this 45 degree limit. And should a target start sliding off something, that new direction they slide in is now used as the reference to calculate their trajectory angle. The physics behind it is actually quite intuitive, and is why some extreme examples like this impact from the previous game can look so fucked up. That was totally legit though. I will not explain why, this video is already way too long. This angle requirement was installed last game because Rocket Punch could one-shot players with its wall impact, so it was used as a power limiter to prevent it from happening literally everywhere. But Punch is not nearly as threatening or immediately impactful like that anymore, so is an impact angle requirement still necessary at all? The short answer is yes, or well, some absolutely crazy shit would happen. But I found myself asking, does the angle limit still need to be at 45 degrees? What if it was slightly wider? I see this mechanic as another one of those arbitrary limitations I mentioned. That obscene power this angle was limiting is no longer present, so now it's just acting as a limiter to the idea of wall impacts and making sure they look kind of intuitive to players when they happen. So what if Doomfist had more freedom to land more impacts more often? Widening it by virtually any margin could accomplish that and make Doofy's gameplay impact through wall impacts much, much more consistent. However, if we're looking for actual numbers, I would not take it any higher than 60 degrees. Even then, that looks like a bit much. The limit does need to remain in place to look like it makes sense. So to recap, compared to other offensive tank abilities, Rocket Punch feels kinda weak, which is weird given it's the core focus of the entire hero. Empowered Rocket Punch's impact feels underwhelming, and Rocket Punch's natural power limiter may no longer need to be so tight. All of these aspects can be patched up, though I'm not too sure if they need to be. For argument's sake, let's give it a shot. Rocket Punch could do slightly more wall slam damage, further emphasising the skill required to draw out the ability's full potential and amplifying the punch's capacity as a lethal threat. Empowered Rocket Punch's maximum stun duration can be raised back to 0.75 or 1 second for a stronger impact. This is actually the only change here I think would really be necessary. I mean Doomfist and I don't respect Empowered Rocket Punch anymore. The hefty impact and threat is all but gone without the stun it possessed. Sure, its damage is pretty good, the AoE is great, but its final element is the stun. And without an actually meaningful one, the hefty impact empowerment is supposed to provide is just not there, making respecting and fearing it kinda pointless and unrealistic. Given Empowered Punch is the entire reason Power Block exists, having it should at least be a notable power-up. Finally, simply raising the angle required for a wall slam and experimenting with it could show us how much changing this element can impact Rocket Punch's capacity for impact. 
All these solutions provide Rocket Punch with more flexibility, making it easier to apply the impacted holds. The only catch to all these is that they each risk Rocket Punch feeling like total ass to play against. Quite a lot of people already hold that sentiment, so they're all kind of touch and go ideas. I mentioned before that Rocket Punch could remain unchanged and be mostly fine, except for probably the empowered change. I feel pretty strongly about that. Doomfist Ultimate ability has been through a few iterations in its lifetime, and nobody has ever been truly happy with its state. Everybody agrees that its current iteration is the single worst state it's ever been in over the entire history of Overwatch, however not everyone is on the same page on how it should be handled. From the discourse I've seen, there are two main categories of thought. The majority of people are in the high impact camp and feel that it needs more immediate impact, lethality and threat, returning to its Overwatch 1 roots. Then there's the minority in the high frequency camp who feel it needs to provide Doomfist with more opportunity, tempo and uptime. There's also this third camp that wants to just redesign it entirely, but we're going to ignore them for now. I'm in the high frequency camp, and I'll break down why before I get into the solutions and pain points. Doom's ult in Overwatch 1 was aimed at being a pick ultimate. Zoom up, pick a target or two to land on, nuke him, get out. Bob's your uncle, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. No one on the enemy team enjoyed that experience, because 9 times out of 10, there was about nothing you could do about that. So I went through a few changes to try and fix that feeling and never really solved it. And that old feeling is not a healthy way to improve the ultimate. Although I do miss being able to nuke people. With how Doomfist plays now in Overwatch 2, having a nuke button doesn't fit, so the more appropriate way to go is to increase the ult's uptime, which in turn feeds power back into Doomfist's neutral gameplay loop. For those unaware, Doomfist gets accelerated cooldowns while in Meteor, specifically at doubled rate, alongside HP regeneration. These are aimed at allowing him to continue applying pressure after landing if he had just burned all of his cooldowns and lost some HP before ulting. Couple this with the boosted shield game when damaging people with the ult, the slow effect, and the free empowerment, and we can begin to see the role Meteor Strike is trying to fill, and what I believe Meteor Strike is actually intended to be. With how weak its immediate impact is on top of the power it pulls back into Doomfist Neutral, Meteor Strike is intended to be a chain, sustain, and setup ultimate aimed at empowering Doomfist and increasing his neutral presence and threat, while applying very minimal oomph beyond the inner ring where squishies just get murked. Now the problem here is that it's not quite leaning into these properties hard enough to be actually meaningful. It's close, it's really close, but it's not quite there. The accelerated cooldown rate is nice, but it doesn't work quite fast enough for Meteor to properly act like a chain ability and allow Doomfist to continue applying pressure. Mostly because the longer Doomfist is in the air, the more time enemies have to reposition, get abilities back, avoid or counteract the landing, weakening the chaining intent the faster cooldowns aim to provide. On top of that, the effective area for Meteor is pretty small for an ultimate in the current game climate, especially given how weak its immediate impact is. Of all the AoE ults in the game, it's actually tied for third smallest in terms of area of effect. Pulse Bomb comes in as the smallest at a 5 meter radius, which makes sense. And for some reason, Graviton Surge is smaller as well, at only a 6 meter radius. What the fuck? In third, we have Meteor Strike, Death Blossom, and Captive Sun, each with an 8 meter radius. Hammond's Pile Driver is the same radius as this, by the way. Meteor's AoE is too small for some of the goals it aims to achieve, specifically returning shields and setting up danger areas to allow Doomfist to chain and follow up better. As of the healing Meteor change, the cost of this ultimate is god awful given how piss weak it is. It's an ultimate that's focused on chaining and amplifying Doomfist's own power. It needs to cost less and be available more often for Doomfist to actually utilize. A higher cost signals rarity and makes players hold onto it for longer to be used more sparingly or like a get out of jail free card. You know, the opposite of what this exact change was aimed at doing. This element of Meteor is often overlooked as a potential problem, and that's the landing recovery time. It's a pretty hefty recovery given how generally fast the game is, and on top of that, it's extremely predictable. Coming in at 0.8 seconds, this recovery time begins the moment Meteor lands and leaves Doomfist in a predictable and vulnerable state to damage and CC before he can realistically do anything to move out of the way. That's a pretty hefty time to be like this, and sure, Doom can look up and buff a slam to escape as soon as the recovery is over but that doesn't change the fact that he's in an incredibly predictable and vulnerable state for a long period of time, and is forced to burn a cooldown or eat a stun after he lands, disrupting his flow. 
lastly, it's minimum damage. I know, it's supposed to be weak. Man, scaling all the way down to a measly 15 damage at its very edge just feels disrespectful. I want to know what it would be like if it scaled to 25 instead of 15. Having it scale a little better would actually make the landing area even just a micro meaningful. This is what remains of my old school desire to have a nuke button as an ult. Negotiating for an extra 10 minimum damage. Ah oh, fuck, we've fallen so far. If given a proper balance pass, these elements of Meteor Strike could be honed better and turn the ultimate from a complete joke into an actual, meaningful ultimate ability. To truly emphasize the chaining element, we could increase the cooldown rate even more. Let's say 200%, which puts the 6 second slam on an effective 2 second cooldown, and the 7 second block on a 2.3 second cooldown. Hell, what if it was an instant refresh on being cast? Either of these values would allow for Doomfist to more reliably maintain constant pressure and elevate his presence as a brawly disruptive threat and grants Meteor more defined identity. Because the ultimate is not about dealing raw damage, increasing the radius, let's say from 8 meters to 10 meters, would make it easier to hit enemies and wouldn't make the ultimate itself more offensively powerful. It would make it easier for Doomfist to gain shielding and allow him to chain more efficiently, set up larger danger zones and pose a threat. This radius increase would only apply to the outer ring. The inner ring stays the same size. I've created some rough charts to visualize the damage scaling at a 10 meter distance, both down to the original minimum of 15, along with a new minimum of 25, along with what it looks like when nanoed. I made these charts in Microsoft Word, don't judge me if they look a little... funky. If Meteor's cost were reduced slightly, it would promote aggressive use and emphasize the chaining nature the ultimate is leaning into. Using an old ultimate chart from the launch of Overwatch 2, I determined the cost I would like to see it drop to. Now, a lot of these numbers are outdated, but this chart did enable me to scale it a bit more accordingly to other heroes in the game, so it wasn't just shooting in the dark. I would only scale it to something near Diva's Nuke, Ryan's Shatter, and Widow's Infrasight. I want to see Meteor scaled down to this group of alt and alt costs, so an approximate 20% reduced cost from where we stand right now would give Doomfist Meteor more uptime for aggressive chaining and sustaining. Should the recovery window be tightened, it could give Doomfist a little more leeway when being aggressive and landing in riskier situations, while also preserving the window of opportunity to catch him with CC or damage. I wouldn't put any lower than 0.25 seconds, but 0.4 seems like a more reasonable and practical window of reaction time. While it would still be predictable to land some CC on him during the landing window, it would be a lot harder due to the tighter timing, and emphasize the skill required to do it. Finally, if the minimum damage Meteor scaled down to was slightly higher, it would give a smidge of threat to the ultimate, and make what little damage it deals actually a little bit meaningful. With how impressively mediocre Meteor Strike is at its best, I believe that all of these changes, except for change number 4, are required to make Doomfist feel better. From my experience, the landing recovery time isn't generally a problematic thing unless Doomfist has made an exceptionally poor play but having it be lower would give Doomfist some more breathing room to make those misplays a little harder to punch. I also think that if we emphasize speed and aggression, the healing part of Meteor should either be removed or remain untouched and be a feature that leans more into Meteor's capacity as a disengage tool, giving the ultimate the flexibility to be used reliably in either way. I also want to see the inner ring do more than 300 damage, but I'm, I'm weird, I know that's going too far. We conclude with Doomfist's passive ability, the best defense, which grants him 35 temporary overhealth for every enemy he damages with punch or slam, and 75 overhealth for those hit by Meteor, out to a maximum of 200 overhealth. Honestly, this is the only aspect of Doomfist that's perfectly fine. The shield gain per ability is great, especially when you take into account that both punch and slam are AoE, making the overhealth gain realistically any multiple of 35 ranging from 1 to 5, 6 if there's a bob and in theory up to 7 with echo. This passive doesn't need changes beyond number tweaks here and there if needed, it's perfectly fine. There is one thing that annoys me about it though. It's not even a problem, it's just something that irks my monkey brain. The best defense can provide Doomfist with up to 200 overhealth, 
So in instances where Doomfist lands in a crowd of people with Meteor and gains the full 200 overhealth, the math says he's actually missing out on a little bit of overhealth. It annoys me for some irrational reason. 75 times 3 is 225, while the cap is 200. This complaint is entirely meaningless, but I'll fight you over it. Now I know I said we'd be concluding with his passive ability, but I wouldn't be doing Doomfist any justice if I failed to mention his text. In the beta, several complex texts were discovered and shared with the world. These texts gave us all a glimpse into the potential skill expression we get to taste when the game fully came out. Unfortunately, these texts were removed without warning and then reinstated to a far lesser and now highly limited capacity, ultimately defeating the point of them even being there. This caved Doomfist's skill ceiling in on his own head and caged the limitless potential he had under his belt. I'm not as much of a fanatic about Doomfist texts as some other people, so while I understand them quite deeply, my idea of their impact and potential is somewhat limited in comparison. I wouldn't do justice to them if I tried to describe them myself, so I think it would be better if I let someone else describe them for me. Well, Dim's not supposed to kill him. <laughs> This is Get Quaked On. I mentioned him in the intro as one of the managers of Doofy's bug list alongside myself, but he's also a streamer, content creator, and all around movement maniac. All of Doofy's texts are discovered, developed, and refined by this man alone. He is the reason you sometimes see a Doofy's touching the skybox when we've been casually at Mark 7. And I believe he's the reason a sizable portion of the Doomfist community even plays this hero to begin with. The sheer challenge of pulling off these texts successfully and rolling around at the speed of sound is an enthralling thing to a lot of players. I also like to imagine that Doomfist Parkour was probably created in the workshop as a direct result of Quake's tech development. Whether that's true or not doesn't really matter. Here's what the man himself has to say about the text. Let's go. Movement texts are the bread and butter of skill expression. They're important for the game because they give you more micro control over your movement. This allows you to have more control over what you want your hero to do and this means any movement issues on your part is a skill issue because you have that control, not the game. In the beta, Doom's movement was extremely fluid. He was so fun to play because of how fluid he felt. His movement worked so well with the game's engine because you had the control over how you want your character to move and it was amazing. I actually preferred beta Doomfist over DPS Doomfist just because of how good his movement was. If you ever watched my beta movement clips, you could see all the micro adjustments I was doing with my movement to get a very specific outcome. It's not like it was easy to pull off. You're executing multiple techs on the spot with perfect angles, perfect timing just to get the results you wanted out of your hero. It was peak skill expression. You might say Doomfist's movement was broken in the beta, but the movement that Doomfist can do in the beta is the movement he can still do now. It's just much more clunkier to execute, and you have to actively fight against map geometry to execute these techs. You need to be hyper aware of map geometry now, or else you get screwed over by it. And all of these issues weren't a problem in the beta. Overwatch devs have said that they're okay with techs as long as it isn't overpowered, and none of Doom's movement techs were overpowered. He was still predictable with his movement, even if he did all the crazy things. It just looked more intense on your screen than it did on the enemy's screen. You can't really see the micro adjustments that Doomfist is doing from a third person point of view. What if you're a player who doesn't utilize Doomfist techs? You're just an average Overwatch player who's playing Doomfist. Surely it doesn't affect you, right? Well, that's where you're wrong. When you play Doomfist, you naturally use and come across his movement techs whether you're intentionally using them or not, and sadly the issues with his movement heavily affect your normal gameplay. There's many times when I'm playing Doomfist and I'm not trying to use any text, but because with how his movement works with the map geometry, when I naturally come across these texts, it does the exact opposite of what I want my character to do and this causes my character to miss an ability which completely changes the outcome of the game by so much. None of these issues for Doomfist existed in the beta, but ever since they brought back his movement text in Season 1, which was wasn't fixed properly by the way, Doomfist had a ton of issues that appeared that just didn't exist before. I don't even care about Doom's balance anymore, I just want his beta movement to come back because that is what made him fun. He was so smooth and fluid and when you weren't utilizing his movement text intentionally, the hero worked so well with the map geometry. Actively fighting against map geometry while playing Doomfist is just a nightmare, it feels absolutely terrible and beta Doomfist was just the best version of Doomfist I've ever seen to this day. Not only was his balance better, but his movement was absolutely peak. 
And the worst thing about all of this was that it went downhill because of one bug fix that accidentally broke all of his movement techs. And when they fixed his movement techs, it wasn't fixed properly, so it didn't function the same way it did back in the beta, and to this day, his movement is still broken. Reinstating his techs to their former glory would reopen Doomfist's skill ceiling to the world and allow for unparalleled potential held within to be unleashed. The expressions of pure skill and genuine mastery we previously had at our fingertips could be demonstrated in games once again for an impact on Doomfist's fun factor so great that it simply cannot be measured. The vast majority of Doomfist's techs do not impact gameplay balance either, or forcibly change how he's played. These are options for the player to learn and master, not requirements to play Doomfist. Not having the freedom to do these stifles creative and expressive play. We only want to have fun again, man, and being able to hit our abilities in a specific order and timing to just travel to another dimension at the speed of light is a primal urge an ungodly amount of Doomfist players yearn for. We just want to go fast, man. With all of these potential changes laid out, I need to reiterate, these are not to be viewed as a set of changes, but as individual options, each with their own goals and issues to resolve for the better health of Doomfist and by extension, the game overall. I'm not a total psychopath, I understand that making and balancing a game is not a black and white thing and that buffing or nerfing is no simple task. Too much of either or all at once just breaks things and if these points ever actually get addressed, they can't all be addressed at once like what they tried to do in Season 2. The best way to approach all these points is to do it in a slow, analytical, step-by-step -step fashion and see if and how changes aimed at remedying certain problems impact other elements of the game we didn't think they would. If any of these flaws were to be fixed, Doomfist would very likely need some nerfs to accompany the fixes and level out his newfound flexibility and freedoms. Some potential things come to mind as these are pretty common feedback points beyond HE'S OP! <laughs> Reining in how easy it is to build his tankiness via the passive or god forbid his HP pool for the more high risk high reward offensive tank emphasis is something that could allow him to remain powerful but still requires careful calculation in his play. Think about this like a mirror to Ball who has generally low risk and not all that much reward. Modifying how stock rocket punches stuns work for less general frustration factor and more counterability would make Doomfist a little less of a raw CC machine. And dare I say it, his raw burst capacity could be toned back as well. Specifically how often he can try to get empowered or how high the mitigation threshold should be so that people don't have to face the ungodly impact of empowerment as frequently. Those are the three main elements I see consistent complaints about, particularly the stun one. I don't really have good answers for how these could be fixed except for radical reworks, because the longer I think about all the possible elements that could be changed in relation to these things, the more I run into problems about clarity, impact, reliability and the feeling of how things work. Modifying a tank's ability to be tanky scales way harder than people realise, even with really small changes. Turning back on a burst hero's capacity for burst kind of defeats the point of the design and modifying how the already most variable and inconsistent CC in the game works will only create more confusion and frustration when using it. He's in a design corner. Nothing can be changed without it completely fucking some other element. We can't predict everything, but we can draw conclusions about what certain things would do based on how things work right now, and what about them needs improving. If any changes affect other aspects we didn't think they would, then that changes what future changes would even need to happen. The other thing to note is that most of these might not even be necessary if the rest of the game were balanced a little more holistically to stamp out systemic problems like these. A global damage and healing reduction would make several of the changes I proposed here pointless and would effectively accomplish the same thing I'm trying to do here but be generally healthier for the game overall. Jumping forward to the future for a more relevant take, if I were given control, right now, out of everything discussed in this video, I would look to introduce any of these changes in targeted groupings and see how we go from there. I would also restore all of the lost text from the beta. I want to see just how much skill expression the Doomfist community can demonstrate with an unchanged Doomfist at their fingertips. These kinds of changes are what I believe to be the most beneficial for Doomfist without breaking his power or feeling of power and would be exponentially beneficial to the overall game if applied to the rest of it. That's one hell of a task to undertake though, and it makes you wonder, what if? We come to the what ifs, a collection of popular community ideas aimed at fixing some of Doomfist's perceived flaws and shortcomings. We're going to speedrun this section a bit because they're not as worthwhile to deep dive, but they're still worth touching on. What if Doomfist had some armor? 
Doom is quite squishy for a tank and lacks any way to recover lost HP or a dedicated ability to properly mitigate damage he takes. I could see armor working to make him a little more forgiving, but it's also a slippery slope to make Doom more reliably tanky since his burst is so strong. What if Seismic Slam had a damage ramp up based on air time? In the previous game, Seismic Slam dealt damage based on how long Doomfist spent in the air using the ability and could scale up to 125 damage. Could this concept be applied to Slam now? Maybe. Should it go as high as 125? God no. At its highest, I'd top this out at 75. And this idea could be cool, but it's not really something Doomfist needs. It's just more depth and variation to his kit that doesn't help to resolve any flaws. What if Seismic Slam could be empowered? Punch can be empowered, so why not Slam? It's another fun idea, but when I think about it, what about Punch? Sure, empowering Slam is cool, but the entire point of empowerment is for Rocket Punch to become that really scary ability it used to be, and dividing that fear factor between two abilities would take away from that. It would also box Doom in and force him to engage in a specific way when he has empowerment, rather than leaving him flexible and fluid. What if Power Block had a parry feature that allowed him to block stuns? This is actually something I think they should genuinely consider experimenting with. Doofus is ironically at his most vulnerable when he's using Power Block, especially to stuns. This requires him to take them into account when doing anything at all. And unlike most other openly vulnerable tanks, Doomfist does actually care about being briefly stunned. Meanwhile, the rest of the tank roster has utilities like barriers or specialised abilities to nullify them. Or in Orissa and Marga's cases, can be just flat out immune to them. The parry mechanic would act as a skill shot to nullify the effects of a stun sent Doomfist's way if timed correctly, and allow Doomfist to still block its damage, then continue blocking until power block wears out or is cancelled. This parry window would need to be tiny, but it would provide Doomfist with some actual agency against his strongest counter for an extremely high skill cost. It also grants power block more depth and flexibility to its use cases, acting as a combo master type ability to throw in between abilities in a brawl to stop stuns. What if using power block sped up cooldown rates? I see this idea thrown around quite a lot, and I want to just point out the huge flaw in it. It would only apply to seismic slam. With how his cooldown rotations typically work, Power Block will either empower Doomfist and reset Rocket Punch's cooldown, or it will burn 2.5 seconds off the cooldown, leaving only a 1.5 second gap of nothing. Having an accelerated cooldown during Block would only be useful for Seismic Slam, and at that point you can just lower Slam's cooldown and get a more consistent result for less complexity. It's a neat idea, but kinda pointless given how small its effects actually are, and the fact that it doesn't solve anything wrong with it. What if Power Block generated some overhealth on initiation? Another interesting idea, but also unnecessary. Generating overhealth to act as a buffer during Block is kinda pointless, because using Block ever only goes one of three ways. You get pounded into a corner when no amount of extra health will help you survive, literally everybody ignores you, or you get amped and use it or move to safety. In all of these situations, having an extra little burst of overhealth is pointless. Only in Scenario 3 could that maybe make a difference, but Doofus already has an 80% damage reduction. That's literally the highest level of resistance currently available in the game. He doesn't need more padding underneath that. What if Rocket Punch returned to a 3 second cooldown? 3 second Rocket Punch felt better than anything Doomfist has experienced in his lifetime in the game. The major problem with this was that it was extremely frustrating to fight. Rocket Punch is an everything in one ability. It has damage, a stun, knockback, mobility, is AoE, and can bypass barriers. Having a tool like that on a 3 second cooldown is just too much to handle. It made Doomfist incredibly powerful and equally as difficult to pin down properly. I don't think it was healthy having Punch on a 3 second cooldown, even if it was extremely fluid and obscenely fun. Returning to 3 seconds doesn't solve any problems in his kit either, it would only increase the frustration in fighting him. What if tanks did increased quick melee damage? This isn't just Doomfist related, this idea hit me one day after I executed a full Doom combo and missed the kill by only about 10 health, an outcome that's more common than I'd like to admit. The idea of effort for value is a big focal point for the entire tank role, who usually feel like they have to commit the universe in return for a crumb of value, which is just not a healthy concept for the game long term. While this melee suggestion seems very left field and unimpactful, there are 5 tanks that would benefit massively from this increase. Doomfist, Junker Queen, Roadhog, Monkey, and Wrecking Ball. All 5 of these heroes feature quick melee in their core combos and attack patterns. Doomfist weaves melees in between abilities and hand cannon shots, 
Hand Cannon was even modified last game to allow him to do this more fluidly. Junker Queen has to continually stack bleed to sustain herself, and one of these methods is through the quick melee while Gracie is in her hand. Roadhog got reworked, and virtually nothing changed about the hook combo, but imagine if it were slightly easier to make this one-shot combo work again. Winton features a quick melee cancel as a form of tech when diving for maximum damage output. He literally relies on the burst to be an immediate lethal threat during a dive. Finally, we have Ball. This poor bastard is going through hell right now, but having a higher melee burst would help him assassinate a target of choice a little more reliably. Higher quick melee damage would help these heroes specifically to be more reliable and the rest of the tanks would just get to have a stronger slap for anyone dumb enough to get close to them. What if Doomfist had Uppercut? Okay, here's the deal. Yes, Uppercut was awesome, I miss it too. I yearn for the day I'll be able to just beat the shit out of a fire in the skybox and then laugh as they baby rage and chat, but Uppercut was not a healthy ability for the game as a whole, that's just how it is. There is no way to realistically counter it effectively, and playing Doomfist with Uppercut would effectively force people to play hard counter the tank. Not that they don't already. Don't get me wrong, I would love to see Uppercut return in an arcade mode. It's a stupid amount of fun being a combo master like an old school fighting game character, but for the main game modes, it's not a healthy ability. It would be fun for us, but like last game, everybody we ever dove or fought absolutely despised this ability because it completely took away their agency and was difficult to properly counter unless you were actually a good player. What if Meteor Strike uppercut people in a nearby radius around Doomfist when he initiated it? This idea is kind of a mesh between buffing Meteor and reintroducing uppercut back into Doomfist's kit, and I can actually kind of see this working. Meteor Strike is ideally meant to be used aggressively as a chaining and sustaining ultimate, with its utility as an escape tool being a last resort. This addition would promote that aggressive chaining process, enabling Doom to self set up a kill with Meteor and continue the fight, and when being used as an escape, it will disrupt and annoy anyone caught in it. At its core, this is a gimmick that adds more complexity and depth to the ultimate and promotes its ideal identity. It probably won't ever get something like this though, as they changed Seismic Slam in the beta for this exact combo reason. So while I can't really see it being a healthy option for the ult, I do like it. And finally, what if Doomfist went back to being a DPS character? Hmm, it's THE question. The biggest, hottest, most constant take that splits the Doomfist community straight down the middle. What if we went back to DPS Doom? A lot of my logic and reasoning is similar to everything I mentioned in the uppercut section, so I won't repeat all of it, but I will highlight the main point. DPS Doomfist was fun. There is nothing more to it. He was just obscenely fun to play. The elephant in the room, though, is that more often than not, he was obscenely unfun to play against. That trade-off is not something the devs would let slide in this iteration of the game. Fun factor aside, there is also effectively nothing left to properly mitigate a DPS Doomfist. Sure, Cassidy got Hinder, Sombra and May exist, and Junkrat has his trap, but things like this make the game as a whole unenjoyable when they're all out on the field at the same time. Same goes for any support CC that's also present, and demonstrates the point I'm making with DPS Doomfist being unfun to fight. Because there is nothing healthy in the game that can stop a DPS Doom, he must remain a tank, or more crappy CC and silencing powers would need to exist. And veterans like me are keenly aware that more CC means a worse overall game health. This is the part where we take a step back from Doomfist and talk about Overwatch as a whole. There is another underlying issue that's been present since this game's inception that I don't ever see anyone actually talk about. Game education. The raw learning curve of Overwatch is fucking insane. To a long time player like myself, this learning curve seems trivial, but to a new player, it's probably almost like learning an entirely new language with the amount of little rules and gimmicks they need to keep track of, understand, and react to correctly. It's just overwhelming. I even experienced this firsthand with a friend who wanted to come back to the game after not playing it for five years. You wanna know what happened? She was in literal tears, she was so overwhelmed by the game. Without creators, wikis, and other things like this to support game education and understanding, the player base would be a complete shit show given there are no proper tools within the game itself to properly aid this learning process. This is why we get such wildly variable takes across the ranks. Knowledge is power, and knowing is half the battle in Overwatch. 
I think a lot of this game's core problems could be highlighted faster by actually implementing tutorials for each hero to highlight their strengths, weaknesses and most meaningful ways to play them, which in turn would allow people to get familiar with each hero faster. Sure, hero mastery courses are a thing, but they're almost entirely meaningless in a learning context. They're glorified speedrun tracks. Nothing about them is remotely educational in the slightest, nor are any of the mechanics outlined explicitly enough to properly teach someone without requiring them to infer a good 80 to 90% of what they see. Establishing proper game education within the game is step one. It makes sense, given the biggest hurdle to overcome in this game is literally just a knowledge check about each hero and how they interact, since FPS fundamentals and concepts are a universal thing. There is no clarity. The more casual side of the community is left to fend for themselves and wait for creators to tell them what's happening or blindly guess what's going on in a game with 39 completely different characters, over 222 different weapons and abilities with God knows how many different interactions between them using nothing but a series of information blurbs that in most cases do not give enough detail on how things work. Why they haven't already invested in a set of individual hero tutorials kinda baffles me. Hell, even just a generalized role tutorial outlining the main idea of what they do, what they aim to accomplish, and where they'd preferably operate on the battlefield would be good. Perhaps my perspective on education as a primary teacher in training is the reason I'm able to see this. Or perhaps everyone sees it but just doesn't want to talk about it for whatever reason. What I do know though is that not many people properly grasp just how powerful a good foundational education truly is. We return to the present, on the cusp of Season 10, with Venture eagerly waiting on the horizon. And with the benefit of hindsight, and a deeper, clearer understanding of Tang Fist, I, and many, many others, still believe that the concepts discussed here are the metaphorical keys to the kingdom, not just for Doomfist, but for all of Overwatch. Addressing small oversights like these, enabling the limitless potential for skill expression, and giving Doomfist more opportunity to do his thing without such high entry requirements is the best way to tune him while maintaining a fair and balanced state of power. Forget the bugs, they'll be here forever, that shit will never change. They're not the root of his problems, just a symptom of his design concept. My suggestions are just avenues that I've thought of to address the problems I can perceive and identify as the most impactful. They're not the be-all, end-all. But until little things like these are talked about and addressed properly across the game, I believe Overwatch as a whole will simply never be as fun as it could be, and that's not something I want to accept. To me, this game's capacity for fun has only ever been matched by my deep-rooted love for Team Fortress 2. There's just nothing else like it. And with the shake-up of the game's core in Season 9, it's clear, newfound direction, my hope in this game and faith in the team have been revived. I still struggle to enjoy it sometimes though, because I can see the limitless, unfathomable potential within the game that it aims to achieve, but I can't reach it, because we're still not all there yet. It's locked away and we can't reach it, but my god we're so close to it. I want to see new heroes, better reworks, enjoy innovations and unlock the potential. So I'll keep doing my part to teach the depth and the nuance of the game to new players. Help thriving players push farther and reach that limitless potential that I can see. And play my thankless part in keeping track of Doom's bugs. My name is Cream. And I would like to thank everyone who made it this far. And was willing to listen to some lunatic ramble for an hour and a half about Doomfist. I encourage anyone left watching to talk about the little things and highlight them. You never know what could happen. Have fun everyone. And remember, never accept the world as it appears to be. Dare to see it for what it could be. This was quite possibly the biggest and longest project I've ever worked on in my life. And I would like to extend a thank you to all of my friends who gave me feedback, tips and pointers and weren't afraid to tell me if an idea for the video was total shit. I want to give a specific thank you to Lone Peer and Joe for helping me with my audio setup and making sure I had clean voice lines and was able to modify things correctly. 
like to extend a thank you to the Overwatch community that I talk to on the regular for consistently challenging my ideas and views on Doomfist so that I can better refine them and have a more holistic understanding of everything. I'd like to thank the Doomfist specialists who were generous enough to give me their time to participate in this video. And I would also like to thank my friend Michael, who through all of this project work helped me actually get across the finish line. I had a lot of tech failures right at the end and he fixed all of them for me all while he was moving house. Thank you so much, Mikey. And I would like to extend a very, very special thank you to Get Quaked On for coming in to do specialized voice work here and for just generally being there to help with the bug work as we track and log all of Duke's bugs. Thank you so much, Quake. And thank you, everyone. I'll see you around.